Okay, we have 9 a.m. Are we good on Granicus as well? We, uh, looks like, yeah. Johanna, you, did you say a moment ago Live Manager's launched? Yeah, it's running. And so, Jake, if you would go ahead and open the waiting room fully, that would be great. All right, they're coming in. And we are now live on YouTube as well. Okay, are we all good to go? We are good on this this end. And uh, are we waiting for more folks to uh, come in from the waiting room, Jake? Uh, I'm getting the thumbs up, so I take it that means no. Uh, it is clear right now, and I will continue to let people in as they show up. Appreciate your help on that. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Today is January 19th, 2021. It is 9.01 a.m. Today we come together for a special meeting. Uh, let's go ahead and anybody have a moment of silence that they wish to uh, dedicate today? So I know that uh, we did have an incident uh, nearby regionally um, over in um, Sacramento uh, where an officer lost their lives. Uh, I know that uh, we've had uh, a lot of struggle uh, with the relationship between our uh, law enforcement and our communities. And I, I think a moment of silence in finding ways for us to come together and be able to uh, uh, coexist in a better way. Uh, let's go ahead and have a moment of silence. Supervisor Simon, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I'm taking it from your hand movements that you're not able to. Maybe you can't be unmuted. There we go. There okay. we go. Got it. Okay, ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, for one nation, under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much for that. All right, moving on to item number four, extra items. Uh, this came in my email um, after the posting of the agenda. And uh, this is Senate Bill 74 that is also going through the urgency process through the legislature uh, to help support our businesses. And I wanna make sure that uh, I don't know exactly what the timeline is, but I want to make sure that this gets received uh, by the legislature to know that Lake County wants to see this support for businesses uh, prior to waiting the following week, which may or may not be too late. So uh, I'm not 100% sure that it is an urgency to get it out today, uh, but I just uh, wanted to make sure we didn't miss the goalpost uh, because I'm not sure what that goalpost looks like. Uh, so that is... Uh, one way we, it could or could not meet, I just wanted to be frank with you that I do not have the set date for when this needs to go through. I think it is the 25th, I think when they wanted a response. So I will make a motion to add this and as an, as an ag extra agenda item. Second. If that's okay, okay. with you. There's a, there's a motion from Supervisor Simon and a second from Supervisor Scott. Johanna, if we can get a roll call, please. Uh, maybe Johanna can't unmute. Yeah, my mine was saying uh, could not unmute. So okay, can you hear me now? We sure can. Okay, Supervisor Simon. Yes. Supervisor Crandall. Yes. Supervisor Scott. Aye. Supervisor Paiska. Yes. And Supervisor Sabatier. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll go ahead and take that item up after the uh, rest of our agenda, since some folks are here specifically for that. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on to item number five, 5.1. Oh, we are a minute. We need to wait 30 seconds before we move forward and definitely 30 seconds. There we go, 9.05. So let's go ahead and open up public input. This is for any public input on 
uh, items that are not on our agenda today. Uh, Jake, let's go ahead and open up the Zoom room and see if we have any public comment. All right, I've sent an unmute request out to the Zoom floor. If you'd like to make a comment, please unmute and state your first and last name. Okay, hearing none, let's go ahead and close public input and move on to item 5.2. Our, oh, I should have waited a 30 seconds more for public input. 906 is our next item. We'll go ahead and pause for another 30 seconds. I hope everybody is uh, regaining their electricity if they've lost their electricity overnight. I know that that happened uh, in multiple areas. Uh, including in District 2 as well. I've never seen so many PG&E trucks in one area. Uh, it was quite jam-packed on Lakeshore Drive. Uh, so best of luck to PG&E with bringing that back. All right, it's 9.06 a.m., 5.2, consideration of update on COVID-19. And I see that we have Dr. Pace with us. Dr. Pace, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Supervisors. Um, this is an update on the... Um, COVID response in the county. I'm going to try to make this brief and focus on the vaccines mainly, which is what there's a lot of interest in. Um, just a, for a brief update of where the county is at, we're continuing to have widespread transmission. I'm not going to show slides today just because it's continuing on the same arc as it was the previous weeks. We, we have a higher number of cases last week than we've ever had before. And this week we're on pace to, to do the same. Um, the the uh, uh, it's widespread throughout the whole county. There's, um, it's in all the various parts, multiple businesses, different locations. Both the hospitals are um, pretty well full and are working at trying to accommodate as best they can. Um, to give a, a picture of the of the state right now, the state actually is starting to look better. The, the curve is starting to flatten out in both the new cases and the hospitalizations. The death rate continues to rise, but Overall, it seems like the surge from Christmas and New Year's may not be as bad as we were initially concerned about. We're not seeing that same um, response in Lake County. And uh, partly that may be because we are more rural and tend to lag behind the other parts of the state, but it also may be because we are in the Rancho, um, uh, sec uh, Rancho uh, region which is not as closed down as much as the rest of the state. So this may be partly a result of the fact that there have been fewer restrictions over the last month or so. So we'll have to see. Hopefully we start seeing a turn, a turning the corner here in the next week or two. That's what we're hoping. But I think right now we are in the, some of the hardest part that we're going to be seeing. Um, we are, like I said, the, the hospitals are, are in the region, continue to be pretty full. In the Bay Area and in Sacramento, they're down under around 10%. The Rancho ICU capacity is still around 30%, so we're still above, but that's just not that very many beds. And most of our transfers go down into the Bay Area and Sacramento. So the hospitals are having some trouble getting people out, but over the weekend, there's been kind of a constant kind of working and uh, extra efforts to get people in. We've got uh, something like uh, 15 plus COVID positive people just in the local hospitals, and that doesn't even include the people that have been transferred out. And so, you know, there's just, we're, we're in this kind of tipping point where we've been for a week or two, and uh, the hospitals are working hard to keep things going and, and managing. And so far, we're, we're able to keep our heads above water and with a lot of uh, effort and work with the EMSs and kind of coordination with that. So, so far, so good. Um, the main thing I want to talk about today was the vaccine rollout. This has, um, you know, been uh, started about a month ago. We first got vaccines in the county. We're working a lot on planning and we're going to expand the planning. We are uh, going to try to sort of enhance some of the coordination and planning around that. I think we're going to try to get some contracted people in to help us do some of that work so that we can broaden our approach to how we're uh, how we're going after things. But what we've been doing here locally is, is working to set up some stand-up clinics. We have been doing that on a small scale. Today is the first day of the new kind of more um, 
ongoing stand-up clinics where we can expand to uh, accept more people. Um, we uh, that that starts today, like I said, and we're we're moving forward. We um, you know the the main issue here is the limits of the amount of vaccine that's coming into the county. We are getting about 400 doses per week. Uh, we're getting 300 this coming week is the allocation. We're asking for more. And if more is available, we will get it. We're prepared to deal with it now. Um, the uh, problem is, is uh, the state doesn't seem to be getting it. They don't know when they're going to get it. And it's kind of week by week where we're trying to move forward. Um, the uh, the tier system is how we're trying to prioritize people so that since there's so little vaccine, we're trying to get to the most vulnerable people first or the people that are most um, kind of impacted by COVID exposure, whether kind of EMS and hospital workers, things like that. So we're trying to focus on that and get to the right people at the front of the line since there's so little coming in. Um, very frustrating for the public, I know, and it's very difficult to manage this because there's thousands and thousands of people that want it, and we only have a few hundred doses. Recently, uh, you may have read that Moderna had uh, one of the lots. There was some question about one of these lots that was uh, that was out, and Lake County had gotten one of those lots. Um, none of that had been opened yet, so none of it is out in the community, um, but we now have 400 doses that we're not able to use while they're trying to figure out whether those are safe or not. So that takes 400 additional doses off the table that when we don't have that many to start out with. We still have enough for today's clinic. We're expecting a, a shipment in today, but you know this is kind of the way it goes. It's sort of day by day, step by step. We're trying to, basically our goal is to get the amount of vaccine that we get each week to get it out in the same week, you know, within seven days before we get our next shipment. Um, we are, uh, the plan here is, is to set up the standalone clinic and to do some appointments through there. That's, we're trying to control it with appointments and we're focusing now on the elders, 65 and older, and the teachers and school staff. And, um, we're really hoping to get the, the people 65 and older that are the most vulnerable, the most fragile, not the healthy folks that are active and able to, to avoid the virus and everything. We're trying to focus on the folks that are the most vulnerable, that are the most likely to, to die if they get this. And so we asked the senior centers to reach out to the people they knew to do that. And we filled the appointments for this week through that way. I, I think it's been frustrating. The senior centers are understaffed and overworked already and uh, but we appreciate the fact that they were part of the way to um, identify the most vulnerable folks and get them in since they know them through the Meals on Wheels and other ways. Uh, folks 65 and older can also uh, access appointments through their medical providers, especially uh, Southern Adventists, they have their own streams of vaccine coming in. And so through those clinics, they're setting up uh, some vaccine sites as well. And uh, they're going to be doing quite a bit this week. So, And um, the pharmacies are also starting to move into this. They're not getting vaccine yet, but um, we are trying to make arrangements with them. So the idea here is that we're going to be really trying to have multiple places throughout the county where people can access the vaccine. And so if the hospitals are able to get more vaccine, then they'll be the ones that are that are giving it. If we're getting it more, we'll probably either work through our stand-up clinics and or share with the other partners. We have shared some with uh, Lakeview Clinic and Lake County Tribal Health so that they can get their older uh, older patients uh, vaccinated as well. So, you know, the idea here is to get as much vaccine into the county as we possibly can and to spread it out amongst the different uh, clinical partners so that people can have access through different ways. Um, the teachers and the, the school staff are able to get the get their they will be contacted by their school districts to set up appointments. At, you know, they're, we're basically allocating a certain number of appointments to the senior centers and a certain number of appointments to the um, school districts so that we can just start walking through whatever vaccine we have and, and getting these folks vaccinated. Once we get to a stable state or once we get more vaccine coming in, then we will be able to open to the rest of the folks in tier 1B, the first level, which is childcare workers and uh, 
food and ag workers and other emergency workers that haven't already been vaccinated. But those folks were kind of putting on the on the back burner for now while we're getting these things set up and getting these these what we're considering higher priority folks to get um, to get vaccinated. I mean, you know, the state and the federal government are the ones who are really giving us the guidance around these things. They've had big working groups working on this, but ultimately in Lake County, I'm the one that's making the decision. And so I'm sure people disagree with some of the ways uh, we're prioritizing or they don't understand why one group's ahead of another group. But, you know, it's very difficult when there's um, such a, a small amount of vaccine and such a high demand and people want it right now. They don't really want to wait a month, which is very understandable. And I really wish we could vaccinate everybody. That's my goal here is everybody that wants it should be able to get it, but we can only do so much with the with the amount that we have. So um, we so we're going to be doing these standalone, these stand up clinics that are going to be running six days a week, uh, three days in uh, Lakeport, three days in, in Clear Lake. We're going to be working with the community partners and and especially Southern Adventists are, are getting a good supply of vaccines. So they're moving forward quickly. Um, we're probably going to be eventually setting up some mobile vans, some mobile vaccination sites where we can go out to uh, basically potentially to uh, employers or to, you know, growers, agricultural folks um, to try to meet certain groups like that. So we haven't, we don't have the staff right now to do that. And we're just in the process of setting up these stand-up clinics this week, but that's ultimately where we hope to go with this. And then if we get a bunch of vaccine, we're going to set up some mass vaccination sites. Um, we, the, if people are familiar with the Heroes of Health and Safety flu clinics that have been done annually for a few years here. Um, they've been very successful and they get, you know, 500 to 1,000 people done in a day. And we're starting to do some planning with the same folks that, that have set that up to possibly have that. But again, we're, we're basically just trying to prepare for when the vaccine comes. Initially, we were thinking that maybe when, after the new administration comes in in Washington, we would see more, but now it's a little bit unclear because it sounds like there's not as much vaccine at the federal level as we thought. So um, again, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're trying to do these multiple plans, multiple ways to get things out. And once the vaccine comes, Did he freeze on everybody or did he just yeah. freeze on me? Yeah. No, he froze on everyone. Yeah, he froze on me. So hopefully we'll get him back in a moment. But I had questions. Well, and that's why hopefully we'll get him back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure, I'm sure he'll be back. If not, he'll have to reboot and start over. Hopefully he didn't uh, lose electricity over at uh, where he is at this moment in time. Okay, do we, let me see here. Um, Maybe just take a five minute break or see if we can get them back. Or, or we could move on to the 915 was, item and then just stop when he comes back in. I'm, I'm thinking let's go ahead and give him a couple of minutes. That way we don't have to have an interjection within the conversation we were just having because it's kind of distracting to start talking about something else when this is a very important topic. Uh, but if he's not back in two, let's go ahead and move on. Okay, he is just yeah, now let's... telling me he does have power problems at his home, but he is dialing in. Okay. Okay, so there's no need for a break. We'll, we'll go ahead and just be patient. Jake, if you'll watch for a phone number coming in. Yeah, that, that wind last night and still this morning as well was uh, pretty outlandish. Glad it's not it, September or October. Yeah, it was windy everywhere. Um, oh, well, it it started too. Yeah.
So I have 920 that just came through and it looks like we're still waiting for Dr. Pay. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, I know Nanette is typically Dr. Pace. I believe that's one of the names that I've seen him pop up as. There we go. Let's unmute him. Oop, sorry. I think you were unmuted and I muted you. Sorry about that. I think these winds are messing with the um, power. 100% and your internet probably too. Yeah. Um, so uh, I was talking about the, the mass fax sites and, and everything that we're, we're working on to try to get things up and to get the appointments going. So, you know, I think this is an iterative process. Things are changing all the time. If, uh, if it's not the best solution to work through the senior centers, then we'll have to try something else. And, but what really what I'm trying to do here is to control the expectations so we don't have 10,000 people think they're gonna be able to get vaccines this week and we only have 400 doses. So we're trying to control that with appointments and with um, kind of being as clear and transparent as possible. And uh, I know it's extremely frustrating for people and um, I'm not sure how to fix that until we get more vaccine. Um, like I said, the uh, child care workers, food and ag workers are going to be soon. How soon? Just depends on how much vaccine comes in. And so I can't really give a timeline. And then the, the next groups will be after that. So we're just going to kind of walk through this in as reasonable a fashion as possible. I think probably the best place to try to get information is on our website. We're trying to update that as quickly as we can, but it's changing quickly every day, you know, so. Um, we are, and we're trying to coordinate these through different groups. So for example, the farm workers are meeting with some of the, the growers this afternoon to try to set up a plan for that. So we're trying to stay a little bit ahead of it, but uh, you know, it's, there's a lot going on. So really, I mean, I just want to say a few basic points and then we'll open it up to you all. But one of the aim is to get uh, as much vaccine as we can, but uh, we're having a lot of trouble with that. And as is everybody, you know, the, this is one of the, the big problems here is each county is trying to scramble and sort of compete and get in front of the other one to get vaccine. Whereas if there was a more coherent strategy to, to rolling it out, it would be better. What they've done in California now is they have an, uh, have an equation and an allotment that they give to each, each county. Last week, they sort of figured out on Tuesday or Wednesday that there were some pockets of vaccine that weren't being well used. That's not the case in, in our county, but I think they found some and then they quickly said, can you use this by Friday? And if you can, we'll give you some. And we weren't prepared to do that. We were starting to prepare for this week. And so some other counties did get some vaccine at that time. Now we're ready. So anything that can come, we're ready to, to, to deal with it. And um, so we've let them know that and hopefully we'll get to see some more. So the first one is we're aiming to get as much vaccine as we can. The second is we're, um, we're, we're basically trying to use up the, what we get every week. So we don't, we're not keeping it around. We're not saving it. We are trying to save some for second doses. It's unclear just what, how the second dose supply is going to be coming in. And uh, that, so we're trying to kind of keep that in our back pocket. So we're able to cover, cover people with their second dose. But essentially, we're not stockpiling. We're not trying to prepare for something down the road. We're just trying to move it through. The third thing is we're trying to prioritize people in a reasonable way and in a transparent way. We're trying to let people know what's going on as best we can. And, um, and not everybody's going to agree with my choices. And, you know, my inbox is filled every day with people trying to um, push trying to advocate for people in their office or in their family why they should be at the front of the line. And, you know, we're just trying to set up these large sites right now and trying to get this out into the community as best as possible. And um, so, you know, that's basically where the whole vaccine situation is, is going to be changing. It'll be a completely different discussion next week, probably. But we are hoping to get this structure in place with these stand-up sites. And this is going to be the, the main place where the ones that we get through the health department can be can, can funnel through to get out to the community. So all in all, I think, you know, right now we're probably at the most challenging place that we are going to be in the pandemic. This, this whatever, two to four weeks we're in right now is we're there. The surge is happening. We're managing it, but uh, 
the cases are still rising in Lake County, which means the hospitalizations will be rising for a couple of weeks at least. And um, the vaccine is not, you know, a very low number of people in the county are vaccinated so far, something between 1,500 and 2,000 probably. And uh, we're, the more people we can get vaccinated and the less people we can get sick and transmitting the virus, the better off it's going to be. So just really encourage everybody for the next couple of weeks to lay low as much as you can and try to have as little um, socializing contact and a little as little public contact as possible. So I think that's it now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pace, for that update. Uh, Supervisor Scott. Good morning, Dr. Pace. Thank you for you and your team taking on this challenge of vaccinating our community. I just have a couple questions for you. Um, do we have any idea how many doses Sutter and Adventist are receiving? And are they using the same um, strategy that you're using with vaccinating, making sure that they're following your guidelines? Or are they coming up with their own rules on who's going to get vaccinated? So we're in communication with both Sutter and Adventist and the clinics. And um, so we're all working together and trying to generally stay aligned with who's getting it. Um, they are getting the vaccine through their corporate structure. So the Adventist corporate and the Sutter corporate get some allocation from the state. We're not really privy to that. And then the local folks ask them for certain amounts and we're encouraging them to get as much as they can to come in and um so but that's sort of in their chain i don't have that information and uh but like i say they've been very cooperative and we're all working together to try to get this out there the goal is the same and there's not really competition you know it's all just like let's just get this out as best we can and they're both really setting working it up through their clinics and through some stand-up clinics i believe it looks like what's going on Okay. And then um, I received a call over the weekend, somebody um, that was that fits in the 65 to 75 um, age group, and they called the senior center and the senior center told them that they're only taking appointments for 75 and up. And they tried to explain that no Dr. Pace said 65. Could the senior centers be trying to do their own priority, um, trying to well, get older ones or? Sorry. Yeah, that, that's the whole point of doing working with the senior centers was to that I really was asking them to look at their the people they knew and try to prioritize the most vulnerable people first. So I was really, however they did that, it was really about trying to get the people at the front of the line that are the most vulnerable and to asking, because, you know, somebody that's 66 and just comes off the tennis court, they are, they, they qualify but they are not really the ones we want to target when we only have a very limited number. We want to target, you know, the older folks that are that are very vulnerable and don't have a whole lot of ability to to work this. So it's um so the senior centers were doing exactly what I asked them to do if they did that. However, they prioritize that. You know, we only had really 250, 300 slots for the senior centers to use and. You can imagine there's thousands of people in the county that are in the 65 and over range. And in my experience, usually the folks that are the healthiest are the ones that are able to advocate most strongly. And so that's why we really are asking people not to call the senior centers because they're getting overwhelmed. You know, their phone machines are full. They're, they're, they can't even get to calling the people that they're trying to call because the phones are just ringing off the hooks. The people that really need this kind of attention and help are the ones that we want the senior center, the, basically the folks Meals on Wheels and those kind of folks that are the ones that are the most vulnerable. So um, yeah, it's complicated and it's gonna be frustrating and it's very imperfect, but I'm not sure a better way to do it right now. I think the folks, most folks 65 and older have a doctor and they probably, the, the best way to do is to try to go through your medical provider and then let the senior centers really target the ones that are the most vulnerable. I thank you, Dr. Pace, for that. I think people are just under the idea that it's going to be first come, first serve. When, when a section is open, it's going to be who can get to um, the phone and get that appointment. But I, I do believe, I think you're right. We need to make sure that we're taking care of our most vulnerable and then working our way down. It's not going to be who can advocate for themselves um, the best in that group. So again, thank you, Dr. Pace. Thank you. 
Thank you, Supervisor. Any others um, have a question or comment? Supervisor Paiska? I have a couple of questions. Um, when, when I was in um, a few meetings last week, um, I, I heard some interpretations of the data that you've been presenting at these board meetings. Um, that wasn't, I felt very accurate of what our current situation is. Maybe, basically they were thinking because the state is seeing um, you know, a, de a decline in cases possibly um, that we are too. And I, you know, I was urging them to come um, at least find the section in the video of these meetings um, to see the slides and to really hear um, the presentation. So I was wondering if you um, could put some of the slides. I, I mean, I react best to seeing graphs. And when I see the bar graphs go up, you know, it really brings home um, what's happening rather than just seeing the, the numbers. It, um, so I'm wondering if you could do a presentation um, or a quick video with Sarah's slides that could show the public easily um, what you were showing us in the board meetings. So are you asking to me to do that now or in the, uh, uh, in the kind of do a Facebook thing and put it out in the public? Okay, sure. And then when the data is updated on Facebook, um, you know, the graph is on our website, but it's not showing up in the, um, on the Facebook page for the county. And I, I think that visual might uh, be more impactful as well. Okay, good idea. And then, um, so seniors that are not associated with the, um, the senior centers and don't have doctors in the area, what's the best course of action for them? Um, even 75 and older, um, what would you suggest? Do they call public health or? Um... Well, again, we don't have any extra appointments right now. I think, uh, you know, we're, I don't have a good solution for that today. You know, hopefully when we get more vaccine, we'll be able to do it. Or, you know, if this goes on this way, I'm kind of hoping the vaccine supply is going to open up significantly and we're going to be able to say, okay, come on in if you're 65 and older. That's kind of what I'm trying to drag my feet because I think that's coming in the next week or two, but we don't know. They're not really telling us. Um, uh, so right now we just, we just don't have enough appointments for everybody. If there's somebody that, you know, yeah, so we're, we're working on that. I think it's gonna be a week or two before we get a good solution for that. Hopefully the pharmacies are gonna start being able to vaccinate people and that's gonna be a way where nobody needs to be a, a patient or anything, they can just go. Great. And so my last question is about um, kind of monitoring the vaccinated population in our county. And you said it's about 1,500 to 2,000 right now, but are we gonna be uh, tracking that publicly so people have a sense of um, how much of our population has been vaccinated? Yeah, the problem, uh, I'm going to, we're, we're working on that. We're trying to get it together. We'll be able to do the health department numbers and it's a little harder getting it from the other places. And so, but yeah, I, I would like to say, let me try this. Let's say by next week, I'll at least give you a report one way or another, because it's something I know the public wants and it's a very fair question to ask and we're we're working on how to do that it's just uh that's we've been really focusing on getting these testing sites up this week and that seemed the most important thing so that we could absorb whatever vaccine is available we wanted to have a platform to be able to put that out uh so i think that's a good a good point is getting the data um and probably try to try to get it on the website is that what you're thinking yeah yeah and I see Ms. Hutchinson uh, has a comment on this. Well, this is in response to one of the questions you asked, if that's okay. Um, we do have a video of Dr. Pace's reports to the board meetings, and which includes the slides. And we have that excerpted and um, can make that available anywhere you'd like it available and save him the trouble of re-recording. Oh, that, that would be great. Yeah. Thanks. Well, I, the last thing I wanted to say is that I'm just really appreciative of um, all of the work that you put into getting these clinics, these vaccination clinics up and going. And I'm going to go volunteer today um, 
so I can see for myself how it's going to be unrolling. And I think my Nana got an appointment, so I get to see her um, come through today, too. So thank you. Anyone else have any comments? Supervisor Crandall? Yes, I uh, just wanted to, you know, uh, kind of uh, say the same thing that uh, Supervisor Scott had mentioned about the, uh, the the vaccinations for the 65 to 75, uh, that confusion. I've talked to different folks this last week. Um, and when I started giving them like the, 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 the report that you gave, they were like, well, we already called and they said they're not doing it for 65 and older. And and. And so I says, we're still waiting. I explained that we're still waiting on uh, the state to give you the uh, the information on when we're getting more vaccinations. So I try to stay to that. And I also try to let people know that it, based on the state's information as well, um, in the, the, the vaccination sites will be in Lakeport and, and Clear Lake. Um, and I actually got to witness the one in Lakeport. It was over at the uh, fire the fireplace or something like that in Lakeport. Uh, a lot of people there, I had to go there for an uh, a, a rapid COVID test for somebody. And so I was able to see how they were doing that in action. It was a really good, good thing to see. Um, and so I just, uh, just wanted to touch base on that uh, to, to ensure that we can get some information out. And I'm pretty sure that you, you're pretty much going to do it um, so that I, I can ensure that some of these folks uh, don't have that confusion any longer about the vaccination. Um, OptumServe, I've been giving people that information as well. So um so that's, I don't really have anything else, just that. Thank you, Supervisor. Can I just say one thing? I just wanna, uh, you made Please. me think of one thing. I just wanna, I think the the comment about people thinking it's uh, first come first serve is really important because it's really not that. And we're trying to, to discourage that because uh, what we're really trying to do is get the most vulnerable people in first. And then Supervisor Crandall mentioned that, and it makes reminds me just please don't show up at the at the vaccination site if you don't have an appointment. We will not be slipping people in or seeing if there's an extra dose. If you come in and you don't have an appointment, we're going to turn you away. Uh, mainly just so that we don't have um, kind of mass, you know people kind of crashing the sites, trying to get things. We've seen that at other parts around the country. And that's why we're really trying to focus on using appointments so that we can help the folks get in that really are the, should be at the front of the line. So thanks. Yeah, thank you for covering that too, because I, I also get the people start stating things like, I want to get the vaccination so I can go visit my family. They, I think some folks have this, this uh, notion that they can get the vaccination and they're clear. So maybe elaborate on that, uh, that it might take some time. Um, I know that that's, a, that's another thing as well. And, and so. Right, so I think a couple points there are really important. The vaccine uh, is two doses. The Moderna is four weeks apart. The, the, so you get the first one, say you get the first one today, within about 10 days, you'll probably be about 80% protected. And then after the second dose, which is in a month, another seven to 10 days after that, you'll probably be about 95% protected and at kind of maximum protection at that point moving forward. We don't really know how long it lasts, but it seems to last for at least many months. Um, the other key point is that even if you get the vaccine, the vaccine is not live, so you're not gonna get COVID, you're not gonna spread COVID. You'll, you may get some symptoms, but that's your immune system responding to the protein. That's not, it's not the illness. So you don't have to worry about that. And then the other piece is that we really don't know yet whether you are contagious or not, whether you can still get the virus and be contagious, even though you're not getting sick. So even people that get the vaccine, they can probably feel more free about being out and about and doing things, but they still need to wear their masks. They still need to social distance. And they need to know that if they go out to the store and are you know, socializing and, and everything, and then they go back home, it's possible that they're gonna pick up the virus and be able to spread it to their family. So you know, these are just parts of it that, uh, that may change. We may learn more in the future once the studies come out, but at this point, that's sort of the thinking is that we need to be really careful still. Thank you for that information. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Supervisor Sack? Yeah. You know, Dr. Pace, uh, just would like to, uh, you know, thank you for the hard work that's being done. I know that, um, you know, a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, I, I had mentioned, um, you know, and, and I think you mentioned something today just on staffing issues. And I know that, uh, 
you know, whether it's part-time uh, help or other things like that, I would just like to encourage you to continue working with um, obviously supervisor or chair Sabatier and looking at any issues that we may be able to help uh, with support here from the Board of Supervisors. I think um, we've already made some, some changes this year with the budget, but just want to continue to say, we understand that your most important workforce is bodies and understand the challenge, not only for us, but the entire country right now to help roll this out. I just want to you know, continue to uh, advocate for that support if it's needed. And um, you know, hopefully if you need something, please don't hesitate to uh, work with our CAO and uh, the chair uh, to bring something to the board to help support you in that manner. I just want to make that very clear. Um, but I understand also the challenges, just having the bodies to do it. Not a lot of folks want to uh, get out of volunteer or get involved at this point because how critical the fight is in the, in, uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic right now. But just, you know, that's one of the points I want to just uh, really reiterate to you um, today, and I'll keep doing it each week uh, throughout this pandemic. Because we know how hard and how you know thinly stretched your department is, and everybody on the front lines that are helping with this, and this is the critical time. And it just you know continue uh, to support that uh, conversation every week. Thank you, Supervisor. Yeah, we are. We're um, we've been moving along, and at the level we were we were working at before we were able to maintain and i think we're recognizing we're we're going to need more help and more support here for this the scale of what's here now especially in the middle of the surge and so there's a lot of talk we're we're working i've been talking with carol and we're working around getting probably hiring some people to help really with the planning and the coordination of this more so that we can have a bigger view and be dealing with some of the parts that we just aren't able to deal with well just for lack of people so we're we're actively working on that and i really appreciate your support and willingness to do that and uh we'll, you know we'll, we'll be back talking about that in the coming weeks for sure because this is going to be a big long-term uh rollout i think over months and uh we'll need a lot of people and a lot of coordination to to get these pieces in place in a good way so thank you Okay. Thank you, Supervisor, for those comments. Um, I, I just uh, have a few questions as well. First, I want to thank Supervisor Scott for bringing up the senior centers. I know that I spoke with the senior center over at Clear Lake Highlands. Um, definitely overwhelmed with phone calls. I think what what what's the trigger is the vaccine was a huge beam of light of hope. Um, and as soon as they heard that... Um, the senior centers were getting involved. I think anybody who is a senior started thinking they could call the senior centers. Uh, but I agree with uh, what Dr. Pace was saying, which is also what the senior centers are working on, which is to contact the people that they serve on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, based on the programs uh, that provides extra help to those seniors, because those are our vulnerable seniors. Uh, I don't think, Dr. Pace, that there is a uh, one way to make this rollout be perfect. I think everybody's going to be uh, happy on one end and upset on the other because it's not them that's at the front of the line. Uh, I think it's just about getting through it, which is um, the unfortunate situation is getting through it also with unknowns. Uh, how long does this vaccine actually last? Are we? Does the vaccine lapse before we actually get to vaccinate the, all the people that want to be vaccinated. There's a lot of questions that are still out there uh, that could create further difficulties for us. Um, and so I, I think it's important that we, we make sure that we do this correctly. And I think that so far, uh, the steps to obtain uh, the clinics in both Lakeport and in uh, Clear Lake are going to be helpful to making that possible. Um, I, I know that I was part of some emails between yourself and the state. Uh, the numbers that were originally being talked about were small and looked like a very long-term process to get a very small amount of people vaccinated over the course of almost the next year. Uh, uh, and those numbers changed drastically over the course of that email. And so I'm looking forward to hopefully getting those numbers to you because that, that's, that's the kind of impact that we're going to be looking for with this vaccination. Uh, 300 a week is just not enough. Um, as far as the, uh, we talked about Sutter and we talked about Adventist Health as well, doing their own uh, vaccines. I know that Tribal Health has been uh, doing vaccines for quite a while as well already. Um, and I understand the potential 
issues possibly of having to share that information, but I'm going to ask if Dr. Pace, if you uh, please say uh, no, if this is not helpful, but I'm going to ask for the state to provide those numbers directly to public health, because I think public health yeah, at each county level should be aware of what the population ratio of vaccination is in order to make sure that we adjust our game plan accordingly so. And if we're not aware 100% as far as what Sutter of our pharmacies, uh, then we're going to be kind of left in the dark as to what we really need to do uh, to make sure that we get as many people vaccinated as possible. And I know that the state has that uh, information and so that they should be able to uh, bring that back to directly to you uh, so public health is well aware of those things. Um, the, I wanna talk real quick about the 400 vaccines that you said that we were part of the lot that was a complaint from San Diego area. Um, are we returning those vaccines? Are we getting an exchange for those vaccines or are those lost for us? Well, uh, all we know is we've gotten word from the state that they have some concerns. They're actually mild concerns. There's been hundreds of thousands of people that have gotten Moderna vaccine and done fine. So it looks like they had an increase, less than 10 people, but I think it was probably more than five, between five and 10 people that had a, uh, increased reactions down out of one clinic in San Diego, and they traced it back to one lot. So the state basically out of an abundance of caution said to hold using that lot. And we, one of our shipments, our shipment last week was from that lot. So it's, uh, we hadn't broken into it yet. So luckily it was still just intact. And what the current guidance from the state is, is to not use it while they figure out what to do with it. They'll have to figure out whether it's safe to move forward or not. And they've got a, you know, their team on it and looking at it. So at this point, we're just, holding on to it and waiting to see what happens. And they don't have any replacement. I would love to see uh, sooner than later. Right. And I'd like to see that be replaced sooner than later, because that's a loss for individual counties, which includes us, uh, when we're already such a small allotment on a weekly basis already to begin with. Um, the uh, let me, uh, for, uh, for the rollouts with the tiers, it says food and agriculture. Does food cover grocery stores? Or is that meant to be uh, food handlers outside of retail? The way I understand that, and again, I haven't researched it deeply because we're not there yet, but the way I understand that it's both, it's essential workers that are both in the grocery stores and in the um, you know, restaurant industry. Because I think the idea is, is that these folks have to work. They don't, they don't have the option to go home. And the, if you think of the cashiers in the grocery store, I mean, they see a lot of people in close contact. So their, their risk is fairly significant. So my understanding is it's both. And uh, um, so we want to get those folks vaccinated as soon as possible. It's just, you know, who gets in front of the line and uh, yeah. No, I, I agree with that um, diagnosis of what that says. Uh, the interpretation is the way that I interpret it as well. So I'm glad that you see it that way too. I think it's important that everybody goes grocery shopping at one point or another. Uh, therefore, all the grocery store clerks uh, and staff see basically all of our communities every single day. So uh, good to have them on there. Um, I, I did read a story this morning, which kind of gave me pause, and I just want to check in, and I don't know if we can prevent this. Are we only vaccinating Lake County residents with the dosages we are receiving for Lake County? Uh, I know a lot of people are so, I don't want to use the word desperate, but they, 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 they really want to get protected uh, by getting the vaccination, and they're starting to county hop to look for appointments to be made to get vaccinated. Are we asking people if they are Lake County residents? Are we allowed to make sure that they are Lake County residents? I, I, I really would like to see us possibly prioritize Lake County residents as being the ones receiving the vaccines being submitted to Lake County by the state uh, and the federal government. Is that 
um, something that we're doing, or are we just looking at the basic uh, guidelines of 65, but not locality? Well, again, this is part of the strategy that we're using is we're through the health department, we're only giving it by appointment and it's only by reaching out to people. So for example, the only way to get an appointment at the stand up site right now is to be reached out through the school district or the senior centers, or that we're trying to track people that were in previously in the 1A section that fell through the cracks in some way. So there's no way for anybody to call in to make an appointment at this point. That's not really available. Through Southern Adventist, they're working with their patients, and I'm not sure how they're screening that. But um, I suppose it's possible that somebody that works at one of the schools lives in a different county, but for them to be able to come back to work, that they're getting vaccinated by us, presumably. And uh, so, but again, it's, you know, there's not really a way for somebody to call from Mendocino County and just say, I'm 65 and older, give me an appointment. That's not really available. That's partly, since our supply is so little, that's how we're trying to control it and, and make sure the right people get to the front of the line. It's kind of labor intensive, but it's, um, but it's how we're trying to manage it. But eventually we will get to the appointment style once we get past the, the and we go into just the essential work, uh, which is going to be a very large group of people. Because uh, the way that I see it is when we did the testing, eventually our testing, you couldn't get an appointment for testing for another two weeks because everybody from Napa, Sacramento, Sonoma County, were all coming to us to get tested at one point because their testing was so... Um, far behind in appointments as well. And so by allowing the crossing over of counties, um, and again, I'm just looking to make sure that what we get as our supply uh, as much as possible in the long run goes directly to our people. I think again, our strategy is like with the farm workers will be to try to work through the growers and with the, uh, with the, um, grocery stores to work through the employers so that we give them a certain number of appointments to set up for their employees. I think that's what we're gonna be trying to do at least for a while until we get a lot of vaccine. Um, I think when we're in this very um, constrained amount of vaccine and the really high demand, we have to just control it because otherwise, yeah, if people are coming in from out of the county and getting it, that's, very problematic and very frustrating for everybody. So we're, we're trying to prevent that from happening. Okay, appreciate the uh, answers on those questions. Any other uh, questions before I open it up to the public from the board? No. Okay, Jake, let's go ahead and open up the Zoom room, please. And let's see if anyone has any comments or questions to Dr. Pace on the status of COVID-19. All right, I sent a mute request out to the Zoom room floor. If you'd like to make a comment, please unmute and state your first and last name. Okay, hearing none, let's go ahead and bring it back to the board. And if no further discussions, which I don't, see anybody's hand going up. Thank you, Dr. Pace, for the update. Thank you for all your work. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to our 9.15 a item, consideration of county response to worsening pandemic conditions and impacts to service delivery and B, resolution authorizing temporary reduction of in-person delivery of county services to the public due to COVID-19 pandemic conditions. Ms. Hutchinson. Thank you, Chairman Sabatier. As you know, on January 5th, your board um, authorized the formation of an ad hoc committee that would work with department heads around COVID-19 compliance. We want to make sure that our workplaces are as safe as they possibly can be for both uh, employees and for the public. And so the committee, which uh, was comprised of myself and Supervisor Scott and Supervisor Simon have met several times since then 
uh, in, including some meetings with the department heads. And you know what, we were a bit surprised by the discussion, although um, very appreciative to the department heads for their candor. Um, what the department heads conveyed to us initially is that what they need most is support to uh, roll back the in-person services that are being provided right now and pivot back to the day when, uh, back in the springtime, when many services were being provided without in-person contact. And with that in mind, um, we prepared a resolution which would define those situations where um, in-person contact would be provided um, and uh, establish some other parameters that we hope will be supportive uh, to department heads and employees as we try to manage this really difficult time in the um, pandemic. And so uh, in a moment, I can go over more specifically what is included in the resolution, but I thought uh, we should give an opportunity for our two board members who serve on this committee to speak. Go, first. First. Go, ahead. Super. Go ahead. Um, you know, thank you, Carol, for bringing this item to the board. Um, we thought it would be best to not wait another Tuesday um, to bring this item. Um, we're concerned about our workforce, and we want to make sure that we are keeping our employees safe and giving them the tools needed to do so. We know we cannot provide um, all all our services to the public without having contact with the public. So I, I do believe this is this is a great um, resolution to go about giving those departments the opportunity to, to, to figure out how to best service their um, service the public while still protecting their employees and keep it in mind that if um, COVID goes through one of our departments then that department gets completely shut down so this is what we're trying to do to continue to provide services keep our employees safe and um, you know just thank you Carol for quickly pulling this together and, and bringing this to us today. Yeah, I'll, I'll just follow up. Um, when we said that, uh, you know, I wanted to volunteer for this committee, um, when we went into our first department head meetings uh, to have the conversations, we were really thinking, all right, what can we do to tighten our, our protocols uh, here in the offices, the staff, whether it's courthouse or any other county buildings? And we really started to have the conversation of, where we were right now in the pandemic and hearing from our department heads, it, it really comes down to this. Um, you know, we can, we can do all the protocols, which we'll continue to work on and tighten. There's another conversation we're gonna have today on worksite protocols uh, today on this agenda uh, with some adjustments and other things, but really what we can't limit is the contact. The folks that are coming into the building uh, to work with our frontline staff, to have, uh, you know, interactions, and those types of things. Back in uh, March to June, you know, we 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 shut our offices down completely. Um, you know, I guess you would say at that point we were establishing the protocols to help us keep as um, safe as possible uh, when dealing with the public, having folks come in and interact in the courthouse and all of our other county facilities, uh, and whether it's Department of Social Services, uh, you know, even the Sheriff's Department and other things, looking at. Uh, really just working through this process. And really what came out of the discussion um, was really limiting that contact. It's one of the biggest things is being pushed now at the state level. Mask, don't inter intermingle with any uh, other households outside of your own. Understand the environment and the uh, kind of the bubble that you're living in right now. And it couldn't be more, any more important. I know that we had a discussion at the board level about closing the um, chambers and uh, we move forward with that. I think that was the right decision. Understand uh, our community uh, wants access, wants those things. But right now at this critical point, protecting our workforce is should be number one for us. And I think today with the resolution being proposed and those types of things, ultimately we heard from many department heads uh, you know, about the concerns, but we also understood how they wanted to just continue to serve the public as much as possible, but still control those limited face-to-face -face contacts. And I think we've done a good job, each and every department has, um, of limiting workforce, uh, who's in the office, uh, teleworking, those other things. And I think this would just give them one more opportunity um, to help limit the contact with the public in-person uh, meetings, which we know is the number one culprit of, you know, helping spread this virus. So um, today, you know, we're going to have this discussion. 
Uh, ultimately, uh, it, it came to the to the board because we felt like it was an emergency. We couldn't wait another week in this battle of the pandemic. Uh, we just got through with the discussions on the limited amount of vaccines. We know that's a light at the end of the tunnel, but until that valve is open, we really need to be as careful as possible. Supervisor Scott did a great job talking about uh, departments. We have had cases uh, in our departments. Um, you know, we could lose an entire department if we don't try and do everything. We still may. Uh, there is no guarantee on this. Um, but I think limiting those uh, folks coming into the buildings, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, are, we don't know if they had a temperature check or other things. I know at the county, there's, you know, there we have protocols in place to help protect our workforce. But we just have the doors open and folks coming in and visiting and not doing it virtually. Uh, those are contacts uh, that very well uh, could be um, hit us in a very negative direction, especially for providing services. So today, hopefully we can talk through this situation and do everything we can to help support our department heads and protecting our workforces in Lake County. So that's kind of a long winded one, but that's really where we're at. And this is not where we expected to be when we had our first department head scheduled. We thought we were going to talk more about, uh, you know, tightening up protocols, uh, you know, and those types of things. But it really became apparent uh, that we needed to have this discussion with the full board uh, to really consider limiting those contacts for our workforce to be in all of our facilities. Thank you. So, Mr. Thank Chair, you very much for that update. If your board decides yeah, to uh, adopt this resolution, here's what it will do. Um, it will direct department heads to immediately replicate the um, steps they took during the earlier closure of county offices due to pandemic conditions by temporarily providing for in-person service to the public without in-person in contact, excuse me, providing service without in-person contact, except in those situations where that contact is unavoidable due to court obligations and state law requirements, or when that contact uh, on a limited basis is necessary for the purposes of service of process, recordation of property-related documents, or providing other fiscal services to public entities and independent special districts. And in all such situations where in-person contact uh, must take place and, and must happen, department heads ensure full compliance of, with all provisions of the COVID protocol, which is uh, a future agenda item here today. These items are definitely linked. Um, and the department head will will provide the best possible way to provide those uh, in-person services in the safest manner according to the protocol. The department heads will also support remote, remote work uh, assignments for county employees to the greatest extent possible. Uh, and for non-essential workers that cannot work remotely due to the nature of the work, um, they will need to shelter in place at home until conditions improve. It would also be the expectation and direction of your board in adopting this resolution that all employees comply with the protocol in all circumstances, uh, including but not limited to employee interaction in their departments and in common areas as well. And some of that is also touched on in the protocol, which you'll consider later. And then, of course, we're recommending that this be reviewed no less than once every 30 days until pandemic conditions improve. So the hope would be um, that that we wouldn't have to do this any longer than um, it is more safe and, and more vaccinations are out to employees uh, and the like. So that is the proposal for this resolution. Okay. Any uh, comments or questions from the board? So I, since uh, no one has any comments or questions, I have some conflict in my mind about this. Um, one, I appreciate the fact that there is further conversation about making sure that we tighten our ship uh, to make sure that we follow protocol, because I've stated it before in previous meetings, we are not leading with the best of examples for everyone to follow. Um, I go into specific departments, I go on floors, and I just, I, I don't see us doing exactly what we're asking all of our businesses to do. And um, to, to shut down the public's access to the services we should offer 
and it's not shutting down, but it's it, it's going to decrease. It's going to have an impact. Is I, I see it as a almost a, a a sense of convenience in the sake that we haven't been following protocol to a T. We're asking others to do so, and now we're going to reduce the services because of the fact that it, it's going to create inefficiencies, um, and it's going to make it difficult and. What's a matter of convenience for us is a matter of the inconvenience to the public when we could have could have and should have been doing better. Um, I know I've had some personal communications with specific departments about doing better, seen them doing better, but I don't see them doing exactly what we're asking them to do. Uh, and I, I feel like I, I want that convert. What I'm saying is I want that conversation to continue because we need to we need to step up our game. Uh, we we need to sh show exactly what we're asking everyone to do, um, because we get to uh, set the rules and set the tone, and and it just seems like it's it's a matter of convenience. When I just spoke with individuals here in the courthouse who are here every single day in the courthouse, they're at the front of the courthouse. They see every person that walks into the courthouse. They follow protocols to a T. And none of them have had to quarantine. None of them have had to stay home because they're following the rules. And granted, there's going to always be a percentage that follow the rules to a T. And by chance, you also uh, uh, got the virus. But if if our staff is not, uh, the reason we're here is to serve the community. And so I would like to change the title where the title says reduction of in-person delivery of county services. And I don't know if we need to change the title, but and to continue public services to the community because we need to find ways to do it. And, and if we need to buy more webcams for everybody at the front desk so they can have almost an in-person dialogue with people rather than having a phone call, which may or may not be able to uh, get picked up, I think that we need to be able to have that personal contact, uh, seeing a face and being, we're, we're all doing it, we're doing it right now, and, and we can make that happen. And I wanna make sure that if, if we're, we're going in this direction that we try our best to make it as convenient as possible to the public because right now it's an inconvenience to the public uh, especially if you're trying to uh, build fix or upgrade your business to be able to maintain during uh, this pandemic if you're trying to uh, um, figure out what's going on with your property taxes if you're trying to figure out what's going on with code enforcement there's so many different actions that we're taking uh, that that that's what we do uh, to serve our communities. That we only cannot create more inefficiencies for the public to be able to reach out, make contact, and resolve any of their problems. Um, and and it's hard for me to see us not doing one thing and then saying we're gonna we're gonna reduce uh, the in person and and we need to reduce on one end but increase the communication possibility on the other end as well. And I get it, we want to keep people safe, uh, and, and that's definitely a, a priority, but we need to also recognize that our purpose here is to serve the community, and we need to make sure that everybody has a technology and they have to continue to be as efficient as possible. Um, Supervisor, I'd like to you know just respond to that. Um, we heard that, um, you know, loud and clear. That was a topic uh, that we had with our department heads and we were talking about uh, moving forward with these things is tightening up those protocols and continue to working on, as you say, working towards setting the example uh, as we move forward with this. I know that I'm committed and uh, Supervisor Scott is committed, um, you know, as we move forward. This is uh, just one step in the process of, you know, dealing with this pandemic and where it is right now. And uh, moving through that process, we'll continue to have those meetings with the committee. And um, I know uh, CAO uh, Hutchinson and uh, Supervisor Scott, this was part of the conversation of where we're going forward, not just uh, protecting our workforce, but also making sure uh, that what we learned back in March through June is implemented, uh, is hopefully honed in even into better so we can work on uh, that service to the public. And understand this is, um, you know, not an easy conversation to have, but we felt like it was the important one to have right now and uh, to continue down this road of doing what we can uh, to help 
uh, support our workforce, um, where we continue to give those services. So it is a challenge heard loud and clear, and I think it's heard. I, hopefully we have some department heads that will, uh, you know, speak up today, but, uh, you know, this is something uh, that we feel like we just need to continue down the road to, to refine on both sides. I appreciate the comments and I do appreciate the continued conversation that will occur as well. Uh, and, and real quick, uh, Ms. Hutchinson, I'll get to you in a second. Uh, I think that, I, and I didn't see it on there, but I just want, want to make sure and state it. I don't think we should be forcing people to work remotely uh, because of the fact that houses are not equal and that internet is not equal, uh, the ability to have office space in your home is not equal, the ability to even access internet. If you have good internet, when you have children at home, just make it uh, a very inefficient and distracting situation and will uh, use their, their correct judgment to uh, not send people home who have the inability to work from home uh, when they could probably possibly provide a safe environment for them by reducing the other staff that can work from home. Uh, so I, I, I just wanted to make that statement that um, we offer uh, equal opportunities here in an office by offering uh, electricity, climate control, and intercess. And once we send people home and, though, and they're not contracted as contractors to work from home, they're contracted to work here for us in the office, uh, that we need to make sure that we recognize that there is inequality at the home uh, and, and, if, um, and to, to, to figure out how to maneuver through that without any problems. Ms. Hutchinson? Yes, based on your comments, uh, Mr. Chair, I was going to suggest that we modify the title of the resolution um, where it would read authorized temporary reduction of in-person delivery of county services to the public due to the COVID-19 pandemic conditions while increasing methods for providing services without in-person contact. And I think it makes a good statement for that, but that's just me. I'll look at the rest of the board if they're fine with that uh, title change. Yes. It looks like there's consensus. I appreciate that. Thank you. And regarding the remote work Any assignment. Any other comments or questions before we open this up to the public? Go uh, for it. So I'm just, are we going to hear from department heads and um, hear the strategies on um, how they intend to make these changes? Yes, we hope so. We asked them to all be here and it looks like many of them are today. Great. Uh, Mr. Chair, as far as um, remote work assignments, it doesn't mandate those. It says department heads shall support remote work assignments to the greatest extent possible. But yes, if offices can be right. kept safe uh, and employees can kept, be kept in them, um, that would be department head discretion. Did I freeze? <laughs> I think it's Bruno. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, and he's the one in the courthouse. Oh, yeah. I see. Well. Yeah, with all those great resources. <laughs> um, hopefully he'll be back, but Mr. Vice Chair. I am, I am froze. There he is. There you there go. You. Well, it seems like you got Okay, so Mr. Vice Chair, you might uh, want to open it up for department heads if well. We're yeah, I was just going to go ahead and and also state that I really like that we're coming together as a board and uh, and whatnot to find ways to optimize uh, any methods to try to get the public uh, assistance uh, during the time frame, right? You know, rather than just completely shutting down. I like the discussion. I like it when we always when we come to some sort of uh, from some agreement uh, to try and ensure that. Um, both needs are met. I like the idea of changing the uh, uh, or or adjusting the name, not changing the name. So, um, but with that, I don't, if there's no other questions, um, I would like to open it up for any um, department heads that would like to speak up and discuss this. Good morning, board. Scott De Leon, um, Community Development, Water Resources, and Public Works. Uh, obviously, the third floor of the departments that. Um, that I manage are, are integral to working with the public. Um, I was involved in uh, the meeting with uh, Supervisor Simon and Supervisor Scott, and, and I'd just like to th say thank you uh, 
uh, to uh, to Carol and and uh, the board members for bringing this uh, to this discussion so quickly. Um, you know, we're we're very mindful of the fact that that the all three departments uh, are serve the public and especially in community development with uh, the three divisions there and and soon to be fourth uh, with our cannabis division. Uh, you know, uh, serving the public and working with the public is is what we do, and and I recognize the inconvenience. Uh, however, um, it, you know, it was just uh, Friday the eighth uh, that uh, the the line uh, for community development uh, extended all the way uh, down the hallway with uh, members of the public waiting uh, to to meet and talk with people at the front counter and and. Uh, and frankly, it's it's very disturbing uh, to see that, and and uh, and my staff's concerned. I'm concerned, and 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 uh, the members of the board that were on our meeting uh, or share that concern. So uh, again, I appreciate it. Um, you know, we when we closed in March, we put some things in place. Uh, there's a drop box that's available. Uh, staff is already working on frequently asked questions to put on our website uh, to help direct people. Uh, to getting into contact with us. Um, we are already looking for um, uh, cameras for, for every uh, workstation, if we can make that happen so that we can have Zoom meetings, we can do uh, consults with, uh, with uh, prospective uh, applicants uh, via Zoom. Um, we, um, uh, we're working with the CELA uh, to um, be able to implement uh, the electronic uh, uh, entering, uh, entering of, of uh, uh, building applications and permit applications. Uh, so we're, we're already working towards uh, making it as efficient as we possibly can. And again, with uh, the frequently asked questions uh, to get put on our web pages to help direct folks on, on how to do business with us in, in kind of this new environment. Um, we're, it, it's a work in progress. Uh, I think some of the things we put in place as a result of last year's closure uh, are, we can just step right in and continue with that. And uh, we'll continue to expand uh, our efforts uh, to make things as, as efficient and as effective as possible. Um, I'd like to comment just briefly on uh, uh, the remote working. Uh, we have um, in water resources and public works, uh, we've um, we've we've encouraged uh, working from home as much as possible. Uh, we're going to implement some of that with our community development. Uh, some of our building inspectors are probably going to start working remotely with check-ins with their uh, division head, uh, and uh, again, just trying to minimize the number of folks that are in the office. Uh, we've taken advantage of some empty desk desk spaces. Uh, where uh, to, and we've moved people around and, and tried to get as much um, separation uh, between workers as possible. We have no sharing of offices. Uh, so I, I think we've really made some efforts up here on the third floor to protect the workers and, and, uh, and again, continue to provide customer service. So again, I thank you very much for the uh, opportunity and the discussion this morning. I'll be happy to answer any questions. I see uh, Richard Ford is, seems to be waiting to make a statement. If we can unmute Richard. There we go. Yeah, so um, like in our office, the recorder's office, uh, we're essentially going to be doing the same thing, same with Scott is. I appreciate the fact that you guys have taken this on so quickly. Um, but basically in our office, this is going to reduce our touches down by, um, call it, we had about a on an average, you have about 80 recordings, so that's going to reduce it. You have about three people coming in on average. It's about 240 touches reduction. Um, so we'll reduce our touches um, down to essentially about six people. We do telework um, in our case because we are a pretty packed office. Um, if we do not telework, we're not going to get the spacing we need, which we have. Um, for the most part, the assessors have um, our teleworking at this point. Um, how it will work will be similar to what Scott said, similar to what we did before. We will have a drop box outside of our office. Um, we will be making appointments with the title company similar to what we did previously. 
Um, we will improve on our previous um, logistics is we are probably going to be moving towards kind of a ring scenario where they will actually um, go outside of our door as far as for the title companies, um, hit the ring, we'll see them, bring it up, um, know who they are, bring them in, exchange documents, send them back out to the lottery to also reduce that timing. Um, but similar to what we had before is um, we didn't really have any documents presented to us during the last time we closed the office uh, that didn't get recorded. Uh, we don't anticipate any issue with this. It's actually an improvement to uh, what we had before. That also will be communicated, um, which we do with most of our stuff, directly to the title companies as well as our realtors uh, liaison. And so that will be communicated as soon as you guys hopefully approve this. Um, so that's that's all I have, unless anybody has any questions. No. Thank you very much, Mr. Ford. Uh, Jake, let's go ahead and see if we have any other comment from public. All right, I'll send a, I've sent a unmute request out to the Zoom room floor. Uh, if you would like to make a comment, please unmute and state your first and last name. Hello. My name is Nathan Maxman. Yes. I actually, um, I work in a, I work for another county and we've actually gone to an appointment basis for anybody who's coming in the building, uh, including title companies and such. They have to schedule an appointment. All the title companies have a daily scheduled appointment and they just come in on that, on that schedule. It allows, for controlling the number of people in the building and in each department. So that was just a suggestion I thought you might be interested in. Thank you. Yep, thank you very much. Mr. Ford, you wanted to? Yeah, I just want to just want to respond. Nathan, Nathan's correct is in our county um, prior to COVID, um, title companies have a set appointment and it's a set time and it's for um, for efficiency, because traditionally the public comes and records their documents during their lunchtime. So from about 11.30 to about 1.30 is when the public comes in and they usually record their documents about that time, as far as the way the volume is set up. And so by having set appointments for title companies outside of that window, it allows for efficiency of processing for the title companies, but also for the public. So the title companies don't come in with <clears throat> multiple documents and clog the lane for the public and the public also doesn't clog the lane for the title companies. Um, <clears throat> that basically is going to continue during COVID, um, has been continuing. The only difference is we have been very firm about if you do have an appointment, let's say if you're American, first American and your appointment's at 11 o'clock, um, you need to be ready and come in at 11 o'clock. Be ready to present your documents. If you're missing something, then you'll just come back tomorrow. Um, because we don't want, especially with COVID, we're trying to reduce the touches. We do not want you um, to not come in prepared and then come in with multiple touches through that day. And they've adapted. We've not really had too many issues with it. But uh, Nathan is correct. That's a pretty standard procedure uh, throughout most of the recorder's offices throughout the state, all 50 uh, counties. So. Appreciate it, Mr. Ford. Jake, let's look for another public comment. All right, I have another request out there. If you'd like to make a comment, please unmute and state your first and last name. Okay, I don't see any hands up and nobody seems to be speaking up. So let's go ahead and close down public comment and bring in uh, bring director, this back director Daly. Director De Leon has kept having his hand up, just letting you know, oh, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Thank, Must thank have missed you. that. Thank you very much. That's okay. Thank you very much. I, I just also wanted to comment on Mr. Maxman's uh, suggestion on uh, uh, appointments. We also do appointments. Uh, right now, they're a little, um, uh, well, they're not very efficient because you have to call and, and then we make the appointment and staff is actually working on uh, exploring a um, uh, using technology to help set up uh, appointments uh, where uh, we'll then do the face-to-face, uh, -face, if you will, with uh, through Zoom. So uh, we're working on uh, some using technology to, to, to uh, help with um, scheduling appointments 
rather than having to call in. So we're working on that, but uh, appointments are definitely an option uh, with uh, any of the departments here on the third floor. Appreciate that update as well. Uh, any further discussion from the board before we take? I, I will add one more thing, and that is that the unknown of how much longer some of these things will occur. Um, there's still a lot of unknowns with the vaccine. Uh, how long does it last? Uh, do we have to retake it every six months, every year, in order to... to Thank you froze again, Mr. Vice Chair. Got it. Unfortunately, it keeps freezing. I'm not sure what's going on, but um, there's no other uh, comments from any of the directors. Uh, well, he's already closed public input. So uh, from that, I wanted to see if there are any other adjustments or any other discussion we need to make about the resolution or if not, I guess we're ready for action. I'm ready to offer the resolution, but I'm concerned that Supervisor Sabatier had something else he may have wanted to change or add. I think he's back. You there, Supervisor Sabatier? No, I, I'm back. I apologize. I don't know if it's the will or what, but the internet's never been this unstable. Hopefully you guys can all hear me now. We can. Yeah. Go ahead. You have. So, Mr. Chair, just want to make sure you open it up for public comment for all, not just department heads. I think that was clear. Just want to be sure. And it appears he's frozen again. Yeah, I think he did open it up for everyone, but um, Supervisor Sabate, are you, are, you, are you frozen still? I'm gonna try and stop the video. Does that help anything at all? Can you guys hear yeah, me? Yeah, we can yeah, hear you. Yeah, we now. can hear you. Okay. Okay, I, I apologize. I'm gonna try and see if I can do it this way so that uh, uh, you guys don't lose me and I don't lose you. I, I was just making a statement at doing and implementing in order to work within the confines of this COVID-19 Some of them might be permanent things that we need to continue to look into uh, because we don't know the complete efficacy of the vaccination and we don't know if that's going to put us in an absolutely better situation, situation that we all hope that it will put us in. And so some of these things um, we need to think of possibly as permanent changes or long-term changes uh, versus just temporary. I definitely agree with that. I think as we learn and we grow, we're definitely become more efficient in the work that we that we do. I just wanted to make that statement. Other than that, no changes. Looking for action. With that, I will offer the resolutions with additions to the title. Okay. Supervisor Simon. Yes. Supervisor Crandall. Aye. Supervisor Scott. Aye. Supervisor Paiska. Yes. And Supervisor Sabatier. Um, I didn't hear that. He has frozen again or, um, well, actually we can't tell, but are you there, Chairman Sabatier? Looks like he dropped off completely. Mr. Vice Chair, would you, there he is, okay. I seem to be back, I'm sorry guys. Uh, was there a motion in a second? I seem to have missed some stuff. We're just waiting for your vote. Aye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, board. And thank you, Anita, for helping me draft the resolution. Okay, moving on to item 5.4, 
discussion and possible direction to staff regarding Friday closures. Hutchinson. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, as you know, um, uh, there have been many discussions in recent months about uh, the fact that our offices had been closed to the public on Fridays to allow uh, county employees, I, I'm talking about the courthouse and surrounding offices, um, they were closed on Fridays to allow county employees to keep up with uh, workloads in light of staffing levels being uh, averaging at only about 80%. In November, your board uh, directed the soft reopening of county offices on Fridays where um, departments who had that had been otherwise closed would assign at least one staff person to provide basic customer service on Fridays beginning on January 8th. And uh, all departments that were continuing to be closed on Friday have done that. Um, and the intent is to have full reopening uh, on Fridays to take effect in April. And at your request, I put this uh, discussion back on the agenda because you had indicated uh, some questions about whether or not the timing of, of this requirement of departments is, uh, is appropriate given the worsening can, pandemic conditions. And so I appreciate that. Thank you for the uh, uh, to, for presenting the item. I know that it, one of the reasons I spoke to Ms. Hutchinson about this was it felt like we had a lot of conflicting messages. Uh, we want to reopen on Friday, but we want the board chambers closed. And now we're discussing now about more um, non person, not in person type of uh, communication with the public. It just uh, seems that saying, but you're also going to be open on Friday is a slight contradiction to the safety protocols that we're trying to push. Um, I know that we had stated that we could start implementing Fridays and I definitely want to have Fridays be available. Uh, but we also said that it needed to be done by March 31st. Uh, and, and maybe a uh, compromise would be to say, let's not start until March 31st rather than trying to implement something in the midst of trying to reduce other things, uh, which seems contradictory message to the public, uh, maybe just saying we're gonna look at March 31st as a start date and uh, maybe again, review it as we progress through these upcoming weeks and months uh, to see how we're continue to be impacted by the virus. Well, I'll go Any comments or questions from the board? Wanna... Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm in complete agreement right now. Um, you know, uh, the April 1st, uh, you know, um, deadline we were shooting for was something, and I agree with having a specific, straightforward message, uh, especially for our department heads and for the public, that uh, we're doing everything we can to get to those Friday opening days. And I think some of the decisions we're making today will give us the best shot at doing that. And um, I would support making that change. Um, you know, that Friday's obviously, they're, they're gonna be, um, you know, continuing to look at uh, non-in-person meetings, I, I think, and continue to work that way with our department heads and our work staff. So yeah, I, I would definitely be in favor of uh, really uh, having a direct message to our, our, our public and our, our department heads that uh, we're really shooting for that April 1st and uh, things that we do now hopefully will give us that opportunity to meet that deadline. That's it, thank you. Supervisor Scott. So my question would be, so right now departments are having at least one employee available to the public to answer questions and such on Fridays. That would no longer be the case. We would wait till March. And, and what I would suggest is what we just talked about earlier uh on the not in-person communication where we're still available uh and maybe by appointment uh not uh not push to be open on friday when on the other side we're pushing to close and minimize due to the fact that we're trying to keep people safe it just in, in my mind it doesn't say we want to keep you safe if we're going to force you to be open on fridays and reduce it in other ways. So hopefully uh, the departments can figure out ways to still offer the services uh, as many have been doing throughout this pandemic and before uh, on Fridays, but not in an open state where people could just walk in through the door and, and uh, get access to our staff. Uh, so I, I, I wanna that they can make that work for them, uh, but it just, uh, Again, uh, the um, conflicting I, 
you know, I definitely agree with it being a conflicting message, but I think also too, we, we need to have that Friday available for um, our departments to be able to uh, mm. minimize the amount of people having, you know, five days being able to have appointments instead of the four. So that's my only concern is making sure we're um, keeping that Friday available for um, appointments to lessen the amount of people that might be coming in at one time. So Mr. Vice Chair, oh, okay, Chairman Sabatier is back. Um, I, I think it might be important to hear from the department heads who have adapted to this. Um, and, and the other um, point I would make is that if, if there is a situation where a department truly just has one person uh, on duty, um, then uh, it, it could be that the one person or, or limited persons on duty um, can manage safely without changing this. So um, I know the second floor department heads uh, were working together on it to come up with their plan for the soft openings. And, and it, I'd really appreciate hearing from them because they may very well say that, that this is okay. I, I'm not sure, but I think it would be important to hear from them. And if your board does want to change this and not require the soft openings at this time, we would come back to you next Tuesday with a resolution to make that adjustment. We don't have that on your agenda today. So here's Richard, maybe he has a comment on how they're managing. Yeah, I, I can only speak for my department, but similar to what Carol described, um, we will probably continue with the similar soft opening on Friday for us, um, which will, for the most part, look like every other day. Um, we'll do appointments with the title companies um, it'll function. Like I said, it's going to be a little bit more efficient because we are going to buy a um, kind of ring type of um, scenario um, for the front end. That'll make it a little more efficient um, versus in the, in the last time we had people call in, we'd go out and greet them, grab the stuff within 30 seconds, come back to the office. The ring scenario will make that a little bit more efficient. But yes, we do intend for Friday to, to not make any change. The one point I do want to make, at least as far as my office, is Friday is a very low volume um, day for us. Most of the days, um, as far as volume in the recorder's office, it's really Tuesday through Thursday. So you are talking a, a quite a bit reduction in volume. I think the last time we um, were open on a Friday, um, our average is about 80. We were at 30 documents, and we've had some Fridays where we've been at 10 documents. So in some cases, you know, a third, or in some cases, you know, an eight out of 10, or I should say, um, you know a very very small number um so that's that's basically how we're going to operate thank you director or thank you mr ford is there any other directors that would like to uh discuss uh, this uh item on the agenda Not hearing anyone. Uh, are there any other? Should we open it up to uh, public comment? Jake, can you go ahead and open it up to public comment? Uh, yes, I will. Okay, I've sent an unmute request out to the Zoom room floor. If you'd like to make a comment, please unmute and state your first and last name. I'm hearing someone, but they're not commenting, so I'm not sure if that's about this. All right, so we'll go ahead and close public comment and bring it back to the board for final discussion and direction to staff. So um, it sounds like, um, well, I haven't heard from the other directors, but it sounds like uh, we're just going to go ahead and push it to um, April 1st being the date. Go ahead, uh, CAO Hutchinson. Um, Mr. Vice Chair, what I would suggest is that um, that our ad hoc committee communicate with the department heads on this issue between now and next Tuesday. And if uh, if department heads indicate that um, that the directive for these soft openings needs to change, in other words, be given more time before you require those soft openings, uh, we can come back to your board next week with a resolution to make that happen. 
How does the board feel about that? I'm committed as uh, one of the board members. I'm committed to meet and yeah, see when brings back next week. Okay. So I think I hear uh, Supervisor Sabatier. You there, Supervisor Sabatier? No, I yeah, think I'm you on dropped the phone. up. Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. I called in instead. Uh, Supervisor Crandall, if you can please lead the rest of this meeting. There's no way that I can lead this meeting blind. Okay. All right. So what we're at, Supervisor Sabatier, is uh, we're looking at a possible direction to, with the ad hoc committee going and meeting with the department heads and getting a better assessment as to where we should move forward and come back next week with the resolution that fits this, uh, fit this better. Okay. I appreciate that. Okay. And so... Um, Supervisor Scott and Paiska, you guys are okay with that? All right. Yes. Looks like we have a we have a consensus uh, to move forward and uh, have a meeting, and then come back next week on this item and in, in the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay. So now we'll move to item five. First off, does anybody need a break? Nope. I'm not seeing anyone that wants a break, so we'll go ahead and move no. on to 5.5, our 945 a.m. item, consideration of amendment to the County of Lake COVID-19 Public Health Emergency Worksite Protection Protocol. And this is to CAO Hutchinson. Okay, before I introduce this item, Jake, um, can you see Anita at the bottom of the Zoom screen? She's connected by telephone now. Can you make sure she has the ability to unmute when she needs to? Uh, yeah, I see her there. Thank you, Jake. So, um, so Mr. Chair, as you know, you've, um, you've reviewed this uh, COVID protocol over and over and over again since it was um, first implemented uh, back in May. And it continues to be an evolving um, uh, piece of policy that we hope is supporting department heads and employees in the best possible way in managing all of this. Um, I'm going to let Pam Samak, our HR director, go over with you the changes we're proposing this time. They're um, more extensive. Uh, and I want to thank Pam for working on this through the holiday weekend, as well as Anita, who also uh, worked with us to get this ready for your consideration. So go ahead, Pam. Good morning, board. So this has been updated to add the most recent changes. Um, there were some changes to face covering. Uh, which require people to wear them both indoors and outdoors now. So we updated that section on page two. Um, we updated the physical distancing on page three. Um, we included information um, that has recently passed uh, for employees that come into close contact and test positive. Um, the definitions of multiple outbreaks and major outbreaks uh, and the testing requirements for each of those categories. We updated the uh, COVID testing section on page six as um, those resources have changed. We also added some additional testing resources. Um, we added information on exclusion uh, which is uh, sending the individuals home who have had close contact. Um, we made some updates to the investigation forms with input from the health department, um, changing who gets notified, uh, removing Dr. Pace, and just putting one point of contact at the health department. We updated the uh, investigation forms with uh, those instructions as well. Um, we added a section on page seven on COVID training and when training is implemented. Um, the rest of it has stayed relatively the same. Um, we also added uh, an addendum, uh, addendum two on home quarantine instructions for those people who are sent home for quarantining. Um, and then updated a few of these addendums, pulling information out of the protocol for um, the CDC guidelines for cleaning and disinfecting the facility. We pulled the 
information on training signage and posters out and um, put a link to that information because the document was getting a little bit unwieldy, almost 32 pages. So we just reorganized and um, now we have the seven addendums which are easier to find and a table of contents which makes it easier uh, for the department heads to use this information. Thank you. Mr. Ch uh, Mr. Vice Chair, or, oh, okay, yes. our chair is back and has video. Um, welcome back, Mr. Chair. Um, we're also, we also updated the department self-certification form, and we're asking that your board direct department heads to resign, uh, given that the policy is evolving so much. Um, we want to make sure that, uh, particularly in light of your actions earlier today, that, um, that there is full compliance with um, with the protocol and that it is reviewed with employees every time uh, it changes now and every time it changes and that department heads are ensuring their employees will also comply fully. Excellent. Does anyone uh, have a question for Mrs. Samick or for CAO Hutchinson, Supervisor Sabatier? Yeah, I, I do have a question, and, and maybe this is what the further conversations will be from the ad hoc committee we were speaking of earlier with Supervisor Scott and Supervisor Simon, uh, but I don't see anywhere here anything about consequences uh, for not following protocol. Um, wondering if that's something that will be updated after the conversations continue or if there's already something and I just missed it uh, in reviewing. You are correct that there's nothing specific um, about that in the protocol, um, but there are other consequences when um, duty is neglected, or uh, you know that are that are outlined in our personnel rules. And that, right. uh, Supervisor Sabatier, uh, thank you for that point. I know that um, you know those conversations will continue with the ad hoc committee. I know there's, it's very important. Uh, it's one thing to have them set in place. And as you said, uh, there needs to be consequences uh, for not following the protocol. So uh, that'll, we'll continue that conversation. So your comment is, is heard at least uh, for myself. And I saw Supervisor Scott acknowledge also it's a conversation we need to have uh, when we're meeting with uh, CAO and the department heads and Pam. Appreciate that. Thank you. The rest looks great. Are there any other comments from uh, supervisors at this point? Hearing none, we'll go ahead and open it up to uh, public comment. Um, Jake, if you can assist us with that. Yeah, all right. I have I've sent out a unmute request out to the Zoom room floor. If you'd like to make a comment, please unmute and state your first and last name. All right, hearing none, we'll go ahead and close public comment and bring it back to the board for action. Mr. Vice Chair, I move to approve amendment to the County of Lake COVID-19 Public Health Emergency Worksite Protocol subject to ongoing 30-day reviews. A second. So I have a motion by Supervisor Scott and a second by Supervisor Simon. Uh, Johanna, will you go ahead with the uh, roll call, please? Okay, Supervisor Simon. Yes. Supervisor Crandall? Yes. Supervisor Scott? Aye. Supervisor Paiska? Yes. And Supervisor Sabatier? Aye. Thank you. And it looks like we have a B, direct department heads to recertify their compliance with the amendment protocol. Um, yes, Mr. Vice Chair, we do need to make sure the formatting is correct. Uh, on the um, revised certification form. So if department heads can hold off on doing that until after we send it out to them in final form. But yes, we are asking that department heads re-sign the certification form and post it at their offices. So we, we need to take action on that or I don't think so. I right? motion, if you would. Okay. Mr. Chair, I move to direct department heads to recertify their compliance with the amended protocol also certifying compliance by their employees and post it um, the update cer certificates. Second. So I got a motion by Supervisor Scott, second by Supervisor Simon. Okay. Uh, Johanna, will you go ahead with the roll call? 
Uh, Supervisor Simon? Yes. Supervisor Crandall? Yes. Supervisor Scott? Aye. Supervisor Paiska? Yes. And Supervisor Sabatier? Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. It looks like we have the, we can move on to the extra item. Did we cover, we didn't cover that yet. So um, 4.1. And I'll go ahead and uh, okay. I'll go ahead and present the item if I can. Go ahead. So um, received this email. I, I don't know if it was Saturday or Friday night, um, but it's about Senate Bill 74. It is meant to uh, offer 2.6 billion dollars, and I'll pause right there. The small business grant that we're dealing with right now that's offered to our small businesses is less than 500 million. This one is 2.6 billion, like almost five times, if not more than five times, the same value of the small business grant that's being applied. Uh, within there, it says for uh, employers with less than 100 employees, uh, the current one that's being offered through small businesses is for less than 300 employees. Uh, so there is some good uh, changes to it, uh, a lot of money being offered, and I think that our businesses would be definitely eligible. I will say there is a caveat that it's very vague currently as far as what the details of the criteria that needs to be met in order to be eligible for um, this uh, uh, business grant. It doesn't say what the maximum of the grant is. It doesn't, it doesn't provide much more detail than we're going to help small businesses that are officially business. You have to have some sort of articles of corporation or you have to have some sort of business license. Uh, you must be local to the state of California, uh, must have less than 100 employees. The rest, uh, most likely it will come from the uh, economic and development of, uh, agency in the governor's office and that will probably get created um, if approved by both the assembly and the Senate. Uh, for the state of California. Uh, in the packet that you received for the extra item, it also shows who is supporting this bill. Um, and we do have our state representative, Assembly Member Aguiar Curry, who is uh, a co-author of the bill. And when you look through all the names, you'll recognize that this is a bipartisan bill uh, that is both signed on by Republicans as well as Democrats, uh, which I think is always a bonus uh, when looking at what we're supporting. So um, this is something that I just, I don't want us to miss. I don't want the state to miss. I think it's really important to get as much as we can uh, to our businesses, to our workforce. And so I wanted to make sure and bring this to us before we miss that timeline. And it's a letter that's been put in front of you. I basically took the templates that they submitted to me with the uh, information. I did add a quick line saying, we ask you to please uh, ensure that rural communities have fair or uh, I forget the exact terminology that I put on there, um, have a fair access to the uh, funds distributed through this grant. Uh, and you have the letter in front of you as well. Uh, so you can see that for yourself. Um, but that's pretty much it. Excellent. Excellent work, Supervisor Sabati. Is there any uh, questions or comments about this uh, item of the new agenda from uh, any supervisors? No questions. Just thank you, Supervisor Sabatier, for bringing this forward and um, making sure that we're doing what all we can to support our small businesses here in Lake County, because they are the heart, as we know, um, to this county. And, and, and just to add real quick, uh, because of the small business um, committee, I did some research based on our payroll numbers and based on the number of businesses if we lose a business in Lake County, it's almost like losing two businesses in Sonoma County because we are, are each business has such a great impact in our community. And to lose one hurts us that much more than if Sonoma County lost one. And so we need to recognize the uh, level of impact that a lost business has in our communities. And I want the state of California to recognize that um, and so uh, that I also mentioned that in the letter that our businesses greatly impact our communities that much more. Um, so I, I think that this is uh, uh, something that I would like us to approve. 
and upon approval, send it to the city of Lakeport, who has a meeting later today, who might be able to add it as an extra item, and send it to the city of Clear Lake, who has a meeting on Thursday, so that we can get all jurisdictions to say we support this uh, because we want that united front. And we talked about that last time, but the timeline wasn't correct, and I think we have the potential to have that. Excellent. Supervisor Simon, did you have something? No, I'm, I'm just in complete agreement here. I made the motion so we could add this to the agenda. I think this is just, like we said, one more step forward and doing the best that we can to support our businesses. So, uh, you know, I, I would like to hear from the public and then get this thing moving forward. Excellent. With that, I'll go ahead and uh, open it up for public input. Jake, could you help us with that, please? Yes, sure can. I have sent an unmute request out to the Zoom room floor. Uh, if you'd like to make a comment, please unmute and state your first and last name. All right, hearing no, hearing no one uh, unmute and come to the public input portion of this, we'll go ahead and close it and bring it back to the board for action. And Mr. Vice Chair, since you the chair at this moment, I will take the opportunity to make a motion to approve the letter of support for Senate Bill 74, the Keep California Working Act. And upon signature, submitting it to the city of Lakeport and the city of Clear Lake uh, to see if they can get their councils to approve the letter as well for a uni unified voice on what is needed here in Lake County. Excellent. Okay. So I have a motion by Supervisor Sabatier, second by Supervisor Scott. Johanna, can you take the roll call, please? Supervisor Simon? Yes. Supervisor Crandall? Aye. Supervisor Scott? Aye. Supervisor Paiska? Yes. And Supervisor Sabatier? Aye. Thank you. That matter carries forward. Excellent. It looks like we are now on our closed session item. Um, this item is 6.1. Government Code Section 54957A, Threat to Public Services and Facilities, Consultation with County Administrator, County Council, and Sheriff. And with that- and before we go on closed session, if I can make a quick statement, Mr. Chair? Yes, by all means. I just want to say, I want to thank Supervisor Crandall for just randomly stepping in, uh, in and out and back in. Uh, internet connection is horrible today, but uh, appreciate it. Don't want to waste anybody's time, but thank you very much for taking- Yeah. <laughs> no problem. All right, with that. Mr. Chair, I'd like to reassure you that I'm already in communication with IT to see what can be done to improve upon what has happened to you today. today. We're sorry this has happened. I, I think it's the wind mostly than anything else. Even at my house, the internet was kind of buggy. 